Hello and welcome to Projector, and on this episode, we discover even more about the secret life of pets in this animated sequel. A lot has changed for Max, voiced by Patton Oswalt, and Duke, voiced by Eric Stone Street, since we last saw them. Their owner, Katie, voiced by Ellie Kemper, has married a man named Chuck, voiced by Pete Holmes, and had a son named Liam. Max is hugely protective of Liam, and when he and Duke go on a trip to the country, he meets sheepdog Rooster, voiced by Harrison Ford, who teaches him to overcome his anxieties. While they're away, Gidget, voiced by Jenny Slate, loses Max's favourite toy, Busy Bee, in an apartment filled with cats, and must learn to become come one in order to get back, while Snowball, voiced by Kevin Hart, fancies himself as a superhero, and helps Daisy, voiced by Tiffany Haddish, free Tiger Who from cruel circus trainer Sergei, voiced by Nick Krull. Although the newest of the major American animation studios, Illumination has already had a big impact. You of course best know them for the Despicable Me franchise, which has done huge at the box office, and launched those ubiquitous minions that either love or hate, but managed to get their own franchise the next entry of which is due out next year. The secret to Illumination's success, though, is that unlike their competitors, uh, Pixar or DreamWorks, they have managed to make their films on a slightly tighter budget than them. Their films often cost around 60 to 80 million dollars each, which is around mid-range for a CGI animated film. They make that up, though, with a very aggressive marketing spend, as anyone who will know when an Illumination film comes out, they aim for saturation marketing and then some. It is pretty much blanket. So their movies do very well because there's an extremely high awareness of them. The Secret Life of Pets came out in 2016, and I thought that was harmless enough. It wasn't a particularly remarkable movie, aside from the fact that it is basically Toy Story with pets. Literally, because the plot seems to have been lifted directly from Toy Story. It was directed by Chris Renault, who did the first two Despicable Me films, and he returns for this sequel, which is actually the tenth Illumination film to come out in nine years, which is very impressive. And what's even more impressive is how much money that film made at the box office. The original film made $875 million worldwide. It was the most profitable film released that year. So when I tell you those numbers, the fact that this sequel exists becomes very understandable because it certainly isn't because they have any more secrets. I would love to have been a fly in the wall at a story department meeting for this movie because based on the finished product, it doesn't seem like there was particularly that many of them. The Secret Life of Pets 2 differentiates itself from the original by not being a total lift of Toy Story this time out, but instead it compensates by not really doing that much of anything instead. If you've watched the trailers for this movie and been wondering, what's it actually about? Is there a plot? In the broadest terms, no, there isn't. The first film had a clear story to it. This one does not. It has three parallel storylines, each doing their individual things that are just about tied together broadly by theme and intersect in time for the ending, in time for the climax, but otherwise are just pretty much solo storylines. And so this is the kind of movie where I was really glad that there's actually a voiceover that tells you what the movie is supposed to be about, because otherwise I genuinely wouldn't have a clue. As Max tells us, this movie is about bravery, which is a really broad umbrella that encapsulates all these different storylines, so I guess I'll take his word for it. That's not a bad starting point for a story, but I don't think they went any further than that, to be honest. It feels like they took the first three suggestions they had and just made a movie out of it. Now, I know what you're probably saying. Well, it's an animated film for children. They don't need to make a complex story. No, they don't. But Pixar and DreamWorks movies certainly have good storylines that work for both kids and adults. They put the effort in. In fact, some of their movies are really great on a narrative and 
structural level, which makes the fact that this movie doesn't really attempt to do anything like that glaringly obvious. And making things worse is that you can see the bones of a much better movie here. The very beginning of the film sees Max and Duke dealing with some major status quo changes. The owner falls in love, she gets married, and she has a child. And you would think the movie would be about that, about them acclimatising to the new normal. Maybe Max is jealous of the child, maybe he has to learn that he's not the foremost responsibility anymore, and he must learn to love Liam over the course of the film. I mean, yeah, that might be retreading some of the ground of the first movie, considering that Max had to cede some of his territory to Duke, and they didn't really get along at first, but even so, this is still fairly fertile ground, especially for young audiences. You could make it a metaphor for having new brothers and sisters. There's a lot you could do with this individual setup, and the movie does none of it. It flashes forward through it so quickly. It's like we're not even watching The Secret Life of Pets 2. We're watching The Secret Life of Pets 3, and we just watched the recap before it. It's genuinely really weird, especially because Max has an entire character arc in the first 10 minutes of the movie before the title even appears. His first line is, oh, well, I really hate children. And then by the end of this sequence, he goes, well, I still hate children, but I love Liam. I love this one, which is a touching sentiment, but it would have been really great as the capper to an entire movie. And the movie doesn't even try to expand upon anything that it sets up in this opening. Chuck, the new husband, not a character. He's a borderline extra that has about five lines of dialogue, and his defining trait is that he looks like Duke, because do you get it? She married someone that looks like her dog. A visual joke is not a substitute for an actual character. Katie is still totally one-dimensional, and it's not even about Liam. You think it would be, considering it spends so much time focused on him in the first 20 minutes or so, where they're teaching him dog-like tricks and behaviours, but really he just falls into the background like the rest of the human characters. The film puts so much effort into moving forward its world, about five years or so, I would guess, and it's purely for the sake of a location change. So they can go, oh, we're going to Chuck's relative's farm for the rest of the movie, which is just bizarre and wasteful storytelling considering it's right there in front of them. It also doesn't help that of the three different storylines, the stuff with Max on the farm is the least interesting out of all of them. Now, everyone knows that this movie has had to do a major recast in the role of Max, because in the first film, he was voiced by Louis C.K., and considering all that we learned about him in the Me Too scandal, including things that I can't even mention in the review of a family animated film, that's definitely not going to be allowed now. So instead, we got fellow comedian Patton Oswalt, who I think is a much better fit for the role. I remember saying in my review of the first movie how much Louis C.K. seemed like he was miscast and didn't add anything to the part. Here, I think, because Max is so anxious and so neurotic to the point where he's developed this scratching tick, Oswald seems like he is much better suited to this part, and also he's much more experienced as a voice actor, including a role in Ratatouille. So, that gives a lot more to the film, even if the movie doesn't really give him that much in the way of material, although way more than Eric Stone Street gets as Duke, who has pretty much been reduced to a legacy character here. The situation between Max and Duke has all been resolved now, so he just wanders into scenes occasionally as comic relief. He gets virtually nothing to do other than just to be there because he has to be. So the focus of the story is almost entirely on that of Max. The issue is that because the storyline has divorced them from their natural surroundings, it finds itself stuck for what exactly to do, and long stretches of this particular storyline are entirely uneventful. Oh, Max ends up getting chased by a turkey, or get chased by a fox but nothing is actually occurring on screen. It's just simply hanging around to the point where when it starts going towards an action
action sequence where Rooster and Max have to go out for a rescue, you go, finally, they've actually bothered to find a plot in this part of the movie. And I will say that Harrison Ford is a great addition as Rooster. He's not exactly stretching himself here. He's pretty much doing the same shtick that you see him do on chat shows where he's gruff and monosyllabic and sarcastic and deadpan, just generally acting the sourpuss and translating that into an animated character. But it sounds like Ford is having a lot of fun here and he has some of the best lines in the movie. In large part, that's down to his delivery. Ford knows how to sell a line in a way that's suitably withering. I think the parents that are dragged to see this movie will probably derive most of their enjoyment from him and probably agree with him a little bit. He's there essentially to teach Max to not be dominated by his fears and anxieties. He can have them, but he's got to learn to not have them hold him back. And while there could be an argument that this is maybe a little bit couched in sort of outdated ideas of masculinity, I just wish the movie kind of expanded on the idea of bravery much more than it really does. It seems like the writers basically went, well, we have Harrison Ford here, that means that we don't have to do anything. And unfortunately, while Ford is funny, it doesn't make up for the fact that the plus engine in these sections of the movie is totally inert. The other two storylines see the film back on its home turf of New York, playing for broad comedy, which is where its strengths truly lie, I feel. These two narratives of Gidget in the Cat Apartment and Snowball rescuing a tiger as a superhero are suitably wacky and absurdist enough that they play to the strengths of the Secret Life of Pets films, where the odder and more surreal places they go, the funnier they are. There's nothing on the level of the the sequence in the first movie where they go to the sausage factory and it ends up bizarrely delirious. But even so, both of these plot lines had me way more invested and definitely had moments where they did shine. The stuff with Gidget, where she has to learn to be a cat, really made me laugh out loud. I think I laughed more in this movie than I did in the first one. And also, the moment where Snowball visualizes himself as a superhero, and we see it on screen as a 2D animation, that's great. It's fleeting, and I wish they did more of it. But again, it shows that the jokes here do work. They're mostly written for the gags. The snowball plot line does great a little bit because Kevin Hart is yelling all the dialogue, but kids do love him. I think that that's the part they'll like the most because it's definitely where most of the story actually is in this film and also it's where most of the slapstick in the movie is. And I do think that slapstick is Illumination's strength. If you watch over their films, I definitely see an influence of Chuck Jones's work in there. They try to capture the same spirit but in 3D animation. And like I said, both of these individual storylines work well in isolation. That's also the problem with the film as a structure overall, is that really these don't work together. The transition between the two sequences always feels a little bit jarring. Like you're watching one thing and then you suddenly switch channels and it's about something else and then you come back to it a little while later. There's no rhythm or pacing. There's no attempt to kind of link them together with match cuts and things like that. It's literally stop start over and over again. And you find yourself wishing they were presented as individual blocks. I wanted this movie to ditch having an overarching story and just become a full-blown anthology film because it ends up being this weird halfway house instead. Make it like that classic Simpsons episode, 22 short films about Springfield. Make a little vignette about each of these individual characters that occasionally linked together because the film is clearly bending over backwards to bring back all the characters from the first film that it possibly can. And honestly, it isn't too far from that in the first place. Scenes in this movie feel like they're written as individual sketches rather than trying to forward a story so you can just uncouple them as shorts. And that's exactly what they've done in the promotional materials. You've seen whole scenes from this film used in that very fashion. The best way to describe this movie is 
like having a whole bunch of Looney Tunes shorts smashed together and pretending that's a narrative. Or better yet, if you own any of the Illumination films on Blu-ray or DVD, you'll know that in the bonus features, they have the mini-movies, you know, shorts like that. Each of the storylines here is roughly around 20 minutes or so of screen time. It's basically those slightly expanded out to overall make feature length. And that's pretty damning, to be honest. It's a movie that is really, really slight and wafer thin in terms of its plot construction. And it barely has enough ideas to make an 86 minute running time. I do quite like a lot of the voice cast of this movie and I think they fit their roles really well. Jenny Slate is clearly having a lot of fun as the exuberant Gidget. I think that Lake Bell is stealing scenes once again as the sardonic cat Chloe. She gets some of the best lines and scenes in this film, particularly a hilarious moment where she's on catnip, and I like they brought back Dana Carvey as Pops, even though they don't really give him that much to do here, although frankly, neither does a lot of the name talent in this film, but if anyone's really trying, it's definitely the animators. I could definitely appreciate in this film that it was a step up from the first movie. Illumination is probably cutting corners a little bit. A lot of the action is foregrounded, so you don't have to put too much detail into the backgrounds a lot of the time. But when your eye wanders, and it certainly will, you notice all the small little details. A lot of the props in particular seem like they've put a lot of time into making them very textured, particularly things like Gidget's cat headband. It's a really stunning movie in places. I think it's a really dynamic looking film and also I find the character designs quite appealing in a lot of ways, particularly the tiger who. That tiger is incredibly adorable. Every time that tiger is on screen my heart melts. I just wish that all that talent being put into these images was in service of something much more substantial than this. I can't recommend The Secret Life of Pets 2 not to see in the cinema. It's harmless, it's innocuous, and kids probably will enjoy it, but it's also a movie that aims incredibly low and barely reaches the bar that it sets for itself. It's a movie that you wait to appear on home video. You watch it on DVD or on Netflix, and the fact that it's episodic and doesn't really have that much of a structure to it is much less of an issue there, but to pay family ticket prices, to pay 20 or 30 dollars or pounds to watch this movie on a big family outing, and it's not even 90 minutes long, they have to put a rap song in the end credits just to make it over the 80 minute mark, you really get a sense that that's almost borderline daylight robbery. It's a good example, I think, of a loom coasting on the brand and not really putting the effort into what's on screen, unfortunately. You'd be best advised just wait two weeks to go see Toy Story 4, because even if that doesn't compare to its predecessors, at least it's trying a lot more than this film really is. And unfortunately, the problem with The Secret Life of Pets 2 is that I really genuinely can't think of a major animated film that has been as low stakes, low plot as this one. This may well be the least ambitious film that Illumination has ever put out. The Secret Life of Pets 2 is an incredibly slight sequel, even compared to its predecessor, barely having any real plot in favour of three separate storylines that feel like individual shorts that are just about tied together by the film's end. The biggest problem with the film is that the main story of Max and Duke on the farm is very uneventful, and the film massively underdevelops possibilities for a stronger tale to do with bravery and responsibility, even if Harrison Ford's extremely deadpan voice acting manages to score a few laughs. Like the original, the sequel is at its best when it goes for absurdist slapstick comedy in the plots with Gidget and Snowball, but even these feel thin at best in a movie which struggles to make an 86 minute running time, and while there are relatable jokes for pet owners, these feel more like isolated sketches than an actual narrative. The film is a very cute time pass with some nicely rendered animation, but it aspires to be nothing other than that, and families are best advised just wait until this puppy comes home because this is Illumination coasting as a studio. If you like this review then you can get a treat over at my Patreon where you can see my reviews early among other perks including access to my discord server but until next time i'm matthew buck fading out